If you have your Bible, would you please turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Jeremiah 1, verse 5 will be our jumping off point this morning. Before I formed you in the womb, says God, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Let's pray. Father, we come aware that before us was you. And because of Jesus, before you, we can be. We thank you for what he's done for us. And Father, it's our prayer that our lives are lived in accordance with your will. And Father, may we help to find and live out of your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you saw the story this week, but on Tuesday, we added another human being to the planet Earth. Kevin Raymar Francis Domingo was born on a flight from the Philippines to San Francisco, California. Now, that doesn't seem like a reason for me to tell you that, except for the fact that he was actually born on the flight. And there's been some speculation that the fact that his mother's due date was next Wednesday, and she flew this Tuesday, that there may have been ulterior motives for flying to the United States other than to visit her father. In fact, she stated her purpose. She stated that if she had her will and her way, she was coming to the United States to visit her father and hoping that her fourth son would be born in the United States so instead of being a Filipino citizen, he could become a United States citizen. There's just one slight problem. When you are born on an international flight, the laws are a little, well, confused. Because as of yesterday afternoon, they're still trying to decide whether Kevin is an American or a Filipino. Because apparently, if you're over international waters, then the decision is that the nationality of the parent is the, parent is, or is the nationality of the, of the child. If, however you're over American airspace, then the child is a United States citizen. But here's one of the things that the Filipino, air, Filipino airline people were not concerned about as a woman tells them at 30,000 feet she's going in labor. They didn't stop to check exactly where they were on that little navigation map in business class while they were giving birth to the child. So right now, whether or not her intended plan has come to fruition or not is still up for speculation. God says to Jeremiah, before you were formed, I knew you, and I had already set you apart for a plan. Now here's what gets murky and hazy for us. When it comes to the idea of discovering God's will, the question is, is this a verse applicable to Jeremiah alone, or is Jeremiah being given a larger principle? The principle that applies to each and every one of us, that before we were formed, before our mommy knew our daddy, before our grandmommy knew our granddaddy, before Adam and Eve were mommy and daddy, did God have everything already planned out? Because if so, there's a difference between a 41-year-old Filipino lady and an almighty God when it comes to what he wants to see done. Unlike this lady who can only try to make happen what happens, when God declares and decides that something must happen, then you have two choices. You either can go along with it, which is called righteous living, or you can go apart from it. In Romans, the idea of missing God's plan or missing God's perfection or God's righteous living is called sin or hamartia, using our idea of the bullseye. If we somehow do not do that which God has prepared for us, if Jeremiah's principle is true of us, then what we have done is we find ourselves in sin. Which is why when we talk about the third of the proposed three wills of God, this one becomes... Not just the one that we ask and often think the most about. This one becomes the most important. Let me remind you last week that we talked about three wills of God. One is the fact that God is sovereign. He is king of the universe. That which God wishes to accomplish will happen. 
God can intervene in, in time. God can do things to make what he wishes to accomplish, accomplish. But those things that he has predetermined will happen. Then God has revealed his characteristics and how people who are to live honoring to him should live. It's called God's moral will. We find that in scripture. And the will we got to at the very end of last week is the one we want to look at a little bit this morning. It's the idea that God has an individual will for everyone. This is God's ideal, detailed life plan, uniquely designed for each person. This is the will of God that we often talk to each other about and want answers for. This is the will of God that on October 8th at 3.30, Rachel has to make sure she's in God's will when it comes to whether she's marrying the right man or not because God has already picked the ideal, detailed person for you. You are convinced right now that that is God's will for your life, correct? Okay, go through with the wedding then and make sure that you remember this five years into the marriage as well, okay? <laughs> this is the kind of question that we ask when we start talking about what colleges we should go to, whether we should go to school, be on school, whether we should even finish high school. My mother told me I had to. Because she said, if you don't go to college, you'll never be employable. Okay, I'm over my moment of pain. Anyway, these are the questions we ask about where to work and the big moments of life. Should we move? What kind of house should we live in? These are the kind of things. Is this what God wants us to do is how we ask it. Well, the question is, how in the world do we even know that's where we're supposed to go? How do we set that as our goal? Let me show you how this is traditionally defined. Let's define the target of God's individual will this morning. Here are some of the key verses and the key ideas that people have used to come up with the foundation of God's individual will for every life. We have callings like this. For Jeremiah, we have the calling of Paul in Acts where God says, you're going to be an apostle. And then God says, no, no, you're not going to that part of Asia. You're going to Europe. But are there verses that don't just apply to these one-time moments for great biblical heroes? Well, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 tells us that in his heart a man can plan his course, but it's the Lord who determines the steps. I can decide where I want to go, but really it's God who's going to make sure that each one of these individual detailed things are the steps I'm supposed to take. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, tells us that if you're going to try to start to wonder about God's will, then you've got to make sure you're close to him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not, what? On your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. See, there's a warning there. If you're leaning only on your own understanding, your own thought about life, then you're not trusting God and his great plan for you. What you may think is what God is calling you to do may just be your own idea of how things will work. Your idea that you're going to get on the airplane and make sure you can determine the nationality of your child suddenly is taken away when God puts you into a different kind of labor and you begin to trust that he's smarter than you. Colossians 1.9, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae and in his opening statement said this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we knew that you guys were meeting in Colossae, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with that knowledge of his what? Of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. See, this is a life that doesn't just live the normal life of your neighbor next door who's a Cretan, who doesn't know Jesus. But this is living your life in such a way that you live with full spiritual understanding and the great knowledge of God. And we've got to discover this will of God. And again, if it's God's will, do we have a choice? If God has already determined our lives for us, then we have one of two choices. We either find God's will for our life and live it out, or we have what? We sinned. And your life will be miserable because you've missed the target. More importantly, you have to stand before God and give account for what he wanted you to accomplish with his plan. And you did not because you chose to lean on your own understanding. Which is why it's important to Paul that he prays for the Colossians. Paul says to the Colossians at the end of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 12, Epaphras, 
one of his fellow workers right now who came from the area of Hierapolis and Colossae and Laodicea. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings, and he's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm, once again, in all the will of God, because that's the only way to maturity and being fully assured of the life that you have been called to. But Paul doesn't end there in Asia Minor. He also says the same thing to the Ephesians. Twice in just a very brief area. Ephesians 5.17. Therefore, do not be foolish. Be wise and understand what the Lord's will is. And then telling the employee when he deals with his employer, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ. Also, you're doing the what? Will of God from your heart. Which means if God has an individual will for my life, I will find it out where I'm working. See the logical conclusion? God has already planned the location of where we're supposed to be. God has already decided the perfect job for you. Anybody heard this idea? This is not a new concept. Anybody scared of this idea and trying to figure out how in the world I know whether or not I'm in the will of God? Anybody want to be honest? Does it really bother you when there's somebody who's completely sure, confident all the time that they've got God's will figured out and you scratch your head going, how in the world do I figure out God's will? Which means we can't just define the fact that God has an individual plan, if he does, but we also then have to discuss how do we find it? How does God reveal this plan? How do I know which bullseye is my bullseye? How do I find the target that God has selected for me? Because the reality is, when you get done with school and it comes time to do something else, are there a variety of options and alternatives? Sometimes, depending on how the economy and the job market is and how many schools like you and don't, but I'm going to assume for this group, there are all kinds of opportunities for each and every one of us. Not only that, were there people who disagreed over the options and alternatives you had that were very trusting, wise people who you would have thought would have had the wisdom of Jesus giving you all kinds of advice about what to do and what not to do? How do I find this will? We talk about God's moral will. That one is easy to locate. We know how it was communicated. God communicated his moral will by revealing it to us through the writers of the Bible. How does God then reveal his individual will? Well, Bible characters get lucky. They get visions and signs and they're told. We, however, have to try to work through the idea of inward impression and outward signs. In other words, when you're making a decision, the question is this. Do you have peace? Do you have clarity? And do all the stars magically align? Do all the coincidences just keep kind of pointing you in that same direction? This is how you have to, this is how it's revealed to you. There is no spelled out, because again, this is a hidden secret plan of God. So you have to trust that He is showing you the right things. And, and your conscience and the spirit are working together that you feel comfort. Well, where does this take place? God's moral will takes place where? In the... God's moral will. That which has been revealed takes place in the... It's the book for you. It takes place in the Bible. Where does this decision of discovering God's individual will take place 